Amen, women of God. Is your if you can hear me okay, give me a thumbs up, give me a heart, uh, emoji of some kind, let me know that you hear me fine. And then okay, great, 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 excited. Amen. Okay. Um, amen. Yes, I could. Amen. Amen. Bless everybody tonight. Still getting a couple of the signals um, in order. So bear with us in just a moment. We're giving others time to log on before we begin tonight. And <clears throat> I look forward to Thursday nights uh, tremendously. And um, we've had a powerful series on the making of a queen. So um, in about one minute, we're going to go ahead on in prayer and we're going to begin and then um, take our journey through the word tonight. Um, here. Bless you. Amen. Well, good evening once again, everybody. God bless you tonight. Yours truly, Bishop Kevin Buffett, right here, live in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know where you are, um, but I pray and trust that you are um, in a place where you are not distracted. You got all of the tools of the trade. We're about to break bread. We're about to be um, strengthened from on high. God bless you tonight. Um, let's go before the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to dig right into the word. As always, expect to um, be with me approximately an hour. Amen. God bless you. I'm glad that you are ready. I am ready as well, as ready as I could ever be. Um, expect to be with me about an hour as we dig into the word of God tonight. And um, God's going to be glorified, and you're going to be edified in Jesus' name. I've um, got a couple people in the waiting room, and then we'll get them in, and then we'll go ahead and what we have in store for this evening. Um, really and truly been looking forward to I pray that you are richly blessed tonight. Amen. Amen. So right where you are, let's pray. And then at the end, if you are in agreement, just type amen. And then we're going to proceed on with the night. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we come. Sons and daughters, we come. Empty vessels, we come that you might fill us, that you might pour into us. Father, I pray for every woman under the sound of my voice tonight. You alone knows what is the desire of her heart. You alone know the purpose and the assignment that you have given for her life. You alone are worthy of the praise. Father, I pray tonight that every daughter will be blessed tonight, that another step in the completion of making her a queen will be fulfilled tonight. Father, thank you right now for blessing us and strengthening us on high. Speak to every life situation, every issue occurring in the heart and in the mind. You know just what we need tonight. We sit um, calmly. We sit humbly at your feet. We are attentive. Our heart is receptive. We are ready, Lord God, for you to speak to us. Touch now everything that impacts and touch our life. Give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding. Shift us now in our attitudes and our thinking that we might leave this gathering tonight transformed and built up and equipped even more. Thank you now for every single thing that you are about to say and do. Now, Father, I pray that you would receive my heart tonight. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Use me now. Be glorified through me. Increase as I decrease. And I honor you for it all. Thank you in advance for everything that's about to take place. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. 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 God bless you, women of God. There we go. If you are in agreement, type amen. And we're going to begin to do duty tonight. Now, establish each and every week as a reminder that the goal of Thursday night is to teach the women of God how to reign. That is to, to, to become fully what God intended from the very beginning and to uh, add to our understanding the necessary components that will enable us to function as he designed your life to function. So when we look into the word of God here on Thursday night, our assignment is slightly different than any other time that we gather. This setting is exclusively for the women of God, but the goal is to equip, which means to give women the necessary uh, mental um, and spiritual tools that will enable you to fulfill and function as God intended for you for this season and time in your life for the entire remainder of your life. Every single time he says anything, he empowers the hearer. Every time he speaks, he empowers the hearer. So as you hear tonight, the things, the precepts and concepts that we un uncover will enrich you and it will transform you. Some of what you're going to hear is going to confirm. Some of what you hear is going to enlighten. Some of what you're going to hear is going to challenge and is going to poke and provoke you to acknowledge an area where you need to be um, encouraged or corrected or whatever the case may be. And this is a critical point that I want to make at the outset before we begin to look into the word as others still join us. It is critical that when you hear an area that, that challenges you, that convicts you, that you take the necessary steps to line up with that arena or address that matter. The only way to see growth and experience progress is when the spirit of the Lord is speaking, you take serious the matter that is being revealed because, because if, it, if it arises out of the heart of God, so important for him to utter the word to you and you acknowledge inwardly and recognize that the Lord is speaking to you, then it is important enough for you to heed what he's saying that you might go further and be stronger in the thing that he has called you to be and to do. So what happened, what am I saying? When, when the word goes forth and we uncover certain precepts and practices that needs to be fundamental to a woman's life that she might operate as a queen, think as a queen, live as a queen, along the way, there are things that are going to be revealed where you are in violation. As we look into the word, the word will convict as much as it will confirm. So some of the conviction or much of the conviction or all of the conviction is where God is speaking that here is a standard that I want you to operate in. But because at the present time of your hearing, you may not be in alignment with that it is going to cause challenges for you to arrest your thinking, acknowledge that God is right about that matter and I need to do better, and then set off and employ an agenda that's suitable to God, satisfactory to him, that signals to him you take serious what he reveals. Several weeks ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we, be, we dealt with certain matters of function that a woman needs to know and understand most of it was on the domestic side, how, how a queen must be arrayed at all times like a queen. That is to say that her attire should be of a certain standard and certain presentation, but also her environment, a queen's closet ought to look a certain way. Her, her automobile ought to look a certain way. Her office ought to look a certain way. Everything that her hands touch ought to reflect the value of her life. Everything that you touch ought to come into alignment with the highest ideals and standards because everything that you interact with, everything that you impact ought to reflect what you're being driven and inspired and guided by. Talk to me, somebody. Everything, everything in your life, 
everything in your life, not most of the things in your life, everything in your life reflects what you're inspired by, what you're driven toward, what motivates you. Your standards are revealed and reflected in every area and component of your life. So that when we hear, for example, a word about not wasting food as we dealt with some of the domestic issues a couple of weeks ago, not wasting food and not buying new food when I have leftovers from yesterday so as not to waste what was yesterday, it's, in, it's important that a woman hearing that immediately puts that into practice. Let everything you hear be put into practice. I won't cook a new meal tonight when I know that the pattern that I've operated in in times before has been to cause me to not eat the other day's food and to throw it out because now that's waste and that money could have been better spent, even up until the extent of blessing someone less fortunate or who's in a position of need. I can't justify before God wasting something that could have been utilized by somebody else who's not in the situation that I'm in. And if I'm going to be a good steward in the eyesight of God, one of the, one of the first indicators of my stewardship is that there is no waste to the manner in which I handle my resources. A queen does not tolerate waste. She does not permit that. She does. She can't accept that. She can't embrace that. She can no longer continue to practice anything consistent with waste once she has been shown and has been revealed to her that this is a wasteful practice. This particular thing that I do is not progressive and is not reflective of a woman who's at the top of her game. And this is the assignment for tonight, is to make sure that you are in all things at the very top of your game. In your conduct, you're at the top of your game. In your conversation, you're at the top of your game. In your character, you're at the top of your game. And it ought never to be said that someone is better than you in regards to the thing that you have been uniquely assigned by God to do. God has assigned you to do something similar to others, but he doesn't want anyone to out excel you. Listen to what he says over in Proverbs 31. He says, many women are beautiful. Many women are, or rather, or however he expresses, we're going to look over there in Proverbs 31. He says, but thou excel them all. And this is our landing spot. Proverbs 31. I want you to turn that with me tonight because this is very important that oh, the woman, the women of God embrace this as the goal, as the standard. Proverbs 31. We oftentimes, verse 29, we oftentimes um, hear a thing, but the thing we hear and consistently hear comes into our hearing to provide us the fuel and the understanding necessary to bring everything into alignment. Watch this, verse 29. It says this, right? Many daughters have done virtuously. And I'm reading from the King James, Proverbs 29 and Proverbs 31 and 29. If you're in agreement, send me some thumbs up. Let me know you're sitting in the driveway with me. We're going to be launching from here tonight. Okay. All right. All right. I got two thumbs up. Now the rest of y'all, okay, I got three. There we go. All right. All right. All right. Part, yes, that's right. Work with me. So we're on the same page. And I know that everybody's flowing with me. All right. All right. Now, and these kind of jobs, I've, we, I'm a preacher by trade, so I like to hear some, but we, since we can't do that, I, I call on you to let me know before I just go that you're, you're with me so that we can all begin together and end together. Verse 29 says, many daughters have done virtuously. Many daughters have done virtuously. You're not the only one that does or can do or line up with virtue or practice or embrace virtue. You're not the only one, but here is the testimony that should be said of you. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Let's salah that. Let's meditate on, ponder on that. Here is, here is, here is 
a critical moment right now. It may not seem like it'll sound like it, but we're in a critical moment already. This is a decisive moment in your life right now where you will accept this challenge that no one will be rightly, it will not be rightly said of anyone else that they excel you in anything. This is a moment right here. This is a defining moment right here. This is the line in the sand moment. This is the life-changing moment right here. Right here. There's not a crisis, but this is a life-defining moment right here where upon hearing that, you have to accept that inwardly as a challenge and it's going to come with a cost. Improvement mandates cost. Progress mandates cost. There can be no improvement or progress apart from cost. It's going to cost you more to do more. It's going to cost you more to receive more. It's going to cost you more to accomplish more. There's cost to improvement. That's why this is the shakeout is the moment when all of the lesser women, the women who refuse to practice consistently the things necessary to make her the queen in, in every area of her life, there are some women that refuse to do what it takes to be that because it requires so much. And the only thing you have to do to maintain the status quo is nothing. Nothing is all you have to do to maintain where you are and what you have and, and to go where you're already headed. All you have to do to accomplish the status quo is nothing. Or I should say it this way, more of what you've already been doing. But if you're going to excel, if you're going to increase, if you're going to advance or progress, then that's going to cost you more. And the areas of more that are going to be required are going to be so intrusive, meaning that there are going to be things that you don't now realize that you're going to have to begin to do and other things that you're going to have to stop doing that's going to invade the pattern of your thought. And that's important because it's designed to force you to begin to think different in order for you to see difference in the results. You cannot see different results if there is not difference in the process, the mental processes that will take me there. Amen. So if I'm mandated to excel them all, then I must be willing to excel in the things and the practices which will guarantee that result. Many women have done virtuously, but you excel them all. Special is not something, thank you, Holy Spirit, special is not some, some automatic granting by God. All my life, I thought that special was, was something that God just did here. Okay, here, I'm just going to do something special. Special is a result of special effort, of extraordinary effort. A person who's going beyond and above the call of duty. That's how it results in special. If a thing is noted as special, then there's something that makes it so. What makes special special is that special contains certain ingredients that are not common. Special is special because it's not common. Is uncommon. So if I'm going to be special, and I've never met a woman in my life that did not want to be special. There's no such woman. Every woman I have met in my entire life wants to be or think or feel that she's special. That's the truth. Okay, well, here's the separator. Here's how you know when what you practice 
is uncommon, then you're special. If everyone gets tattoos, if everybody getting tattoos, what's special then is when you don't. Ain't nobody talking to me tonight. Okay. Okay. Just one woman out there listening to me. Okay. Ain't nobody else. Is anybody else in the car with us this morning or tonight? Okay. There we go. All right. All right. All right. Thank you for the two of you. All right, watch this. If, amen, okay, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. If every woman, I was standing in line today at a store, and I want you to hear my words carefully so as not to make it sound like I'm saying something that I'm not saying. I'm using this example to highlight one narrow point, so don't, don't build an entire theology on this or don't use this as an indictment against anybody. I'm using this example to highlight a point. I'm standing in line today and there's a woman in line in another line adjacent to my line and she had tattoos covering just about every area of exposed skin. And there were so many different colors to the tattoo, to the different tattoos that I could not tell where one began and the other ended, neither could I definitively know for certain what the tattoos were, what, what made them, I don't even know what, I don't know what you got going on. And she looked like a thing rather than a woman. She didn't, this is a personal opinion, just speaking from the exterior, she didn't look pretty to me. She had hidden her natural beauty this is just an opinion she her natural beauty had become obscured or hidden underneath all of the markings now in her view perhaps she thought she was pretty but so which is why she did it but as i looked at her and saw all of the different colors and markings it looked confusing and so what would then signal to me special is a woman who did not practice whatever the common culture practice. What makes a woman special is when you find in her what could not be found in most. That's what makes a woman special. If I do what everyone else does, what's unique or different about me? What made Christ stand out was that Christ contained and functioned and operated in that which no one else could or did. What made Moses unique, what made John the Baptist unique, what made Anna in the New Testament unique, what made Rahab unique, is that in certain moments of distinction, they displayed a character or a gift that was unique to any other woman around. The Bible said of Mary, the mother of Christ, blessed are you among women. God had other choices. He had other options, but she stood out among the rest. And because she stood out, he chose her because she was different. He chose her because she was different, because she would give birth to someone who was different. If I want to produce different, I must function different. If I want to function different, I must think different. If I'm going to think different, I'm going to have to embrace and accept and practice different principles, precepts, and standards. And those standards are not designed to be easy or comfortable because if they were, they wouldn't produce anything different. But in order to produce something different that will cause the world to recognize that there's something about me that's better, stronger, wiser, and far excelling than the ones around, it's going to provoke change and challenge from me that signifies to everyone else that she is special. Special is as special does. 
special is as special does. If I want to be, spe question, question tonight. If God had chosen this generation, if this was the predestined period that the Lord would send his Christ, would he have chosen you? Would the Lord have chosen you to be the mother of Christ? What was it about Mary that stood out? Why did he choose her? I, over the years, over the years, I've noted, I've noticed that men and women entertain certain strategic questions that are unique to the gender. And men and women entertain certain character questions that are unique to the gender. One of the issues that I've noted among many different women I've met in my life at different seasons and times is this phenom of why he chose her. I'm not saying every woman, but I've known a lot of women who have post posited that question to me or or in discussions with them, ask that question because of some type of breakdown in the relationship wherein the man chose another woman and she was wondering what was it about her that caused him to choose her over her. And naturally the carnal mind thinks that it is some type of performance that she does some trick or some thing sexually better and that for he chose her. But I can testify to unite as a man that this thought is common among men that it is not sex that will cause a man to leave one woman for the next because he can find as well as she could find sex anywhere. But it's got to be some other quality, some other component that's unique and distinctive that will separate the two and cause one to stand out above the rest. I ask this question tonight, what is it about you that would have not caused the father to choose you? If God had chosen this time to give birth, for, to, to, to bring his Christ into the world, would he have chosen you? Are you special enough to birth the Messiah? And if you are not, my question is, why aren't you? Why aren't you? What are you doing? What are you, what are you openly, consistently doing and practicing that you now must recognize as an inferior practice if it negates the fact that I would be chosen by the Most High? I know that we're all chosen by him for certain unique things, but what is it about Mary that caused him to choose her? Many of the virgins were in Nazareth at this time. She wasn't the only virgin. She wasn't the only woman. She wasn't the only young girl. What was it about her? There were many teenagers. There were many virgins. There were many women. So those three characteristics weren't the distinction, the demarcation. What was it about her that caused him to choose her? And why weren't the other women chosen? Amen. Amen. This is a self-examination moment. Ah, uh, this ain't easy. This ain't pleasant. Because now as you sit listening to me, you, you got to answer the truth in your heart. Now, let's do this. Let's do something different. Now. now, if you've been obedient, then you're here tonight with a pen, with a journal, with a highlighter, with a notepad, with something to write. So I want you to write this question down. I want you to put this question to paper right now. Because this is a critical moment in what's going to flow in the ministry after this. What's going to happen on next Thursday night. And all the Thursdays that are coming in the making of a queen, this is the this is the uh, uh, here, this is the hinge. This is the moment. This is a turning point. This is the curve. So write the question down, and then let's uncover. Now you're alone. You're private. No one's reading your notes. You don't have to be shamed. You don't have to be afraid. 
Let's examine now what it is. What, what, what am I, what is, what's going on in my thoughts? Ah, watch this. First component I want you to write down is how you see you. Self-reflection time. How do I see myself? Amen. How do you see yourself? If self-examination is going to have any value, what gives it value is a willingness to examine oneself, a tendency to examine oneself, and to do so thoroughly. How do you see yourself? Number two, how do you believe God sees you? Maybe since we know Christ has come, what if the father wanted to give birth to something else? Some, some, what, if, what if God has chosen this generation to bring something else into the world? Some new business, some new, some new concept, some new, some new whatever, and he needs a vessel. What do you bring to the table that's a, a Isaiah moment? Here I am, Lord, use me. What do what 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 attribute concerning you does the Lord find valuable? That's the question. What attribute concerning yourself would you believe that the Lord found valuable? What does he see when he think of you? What I think of you really, really doesn't matter. But Amen. Amen. This is this this is this is for this is for the queens. So now, so now I so I know that there might be a man, as always, there's there's usually someone or both when we're on Tuesday and Thursday, but but since I can't govern and control it, then maybe some of this heavy fodder is needful for him. So we're gonna give him a pass tonight, woman of God. Just for tonight, we're gonna let this man, we're gonna let this man be here tonight. We're gonna let him drink. We're gonna let him have a little of this. I watch this. So the question is now then, what value, what attribute would the father find favorable or admirable in you? I want you to be honest with that question. Now, it would be beautiful if you had a list of things that you felt the Lord thought toward you. But here's what I suspect. I suspect that that might be a short list. And I don't say this in a judgmental way. I don't say this in a critical way. I'm saying this for the benefit of causing us to pull from a deeper, from a deeper source. Because the only thing that could be wrong with you, and this is the only thing, is how you think. And there, if there aren't things changing, it's, a, it's because of how you think. So what attribute would he find admirable or favorable concerning you? What would God, what would God value concerning me? What would cause him to choose me? Okay, watch this. Watch this. Um, go with me to Matthew's gospel. Let's look at this. Let's look at this deeper tonight. Matthew's gospel. Go to chapter number... I want to say chapter number two. Chapter number one. Chapter number one. Matthew one eighteen. 
I'm going to read two separate passages and then we're going to we're going to draw conclusions by examining the word. Watch this. Now, the birth of Jesus was on this wise when his mother, Mary, was betrothed or engaged to Joseph before they came together physically. She was found with child from the Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to say so much right there. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Now, hear me carefully. Look at the kind of man that chose Mary to be his wife. Look at the kind of man that will give you a window into the kind of woman she was or must have been. You can tell a lot about a person by the people that are dominant or prominent in their lives. We can get a clue about Mary by examining Joseph. Joseph was a just man. And the kind of man Joseph was had a significant factor in him choosing and wanting to be with Mary. There were other women available to Joseph, but Joseph chose Mary. It's possible that Joseph chose Mary because Mary contained and possessed certain characteristics and qualities that made her more desirable than the other women. I wonder what it was about Mary that made her stand out even to Joseph. Whatever this thing was, was so prominent that it made her stand out to God. Joseph wanted her because of the same qualities that God wanted in her. Am I talking to anybody out there tonight? Amen. What is it about you? To the good or to the bad? What's going on in you? To the good or to the bad? What are you practicing? To the good or to the bad? What standard have you embraced? To the good or to the bad? What have you allowed? To the good or to the bad? What have you accepted as a norm? That's causing everyone to see you don't use what happened to me when I was five or 10. Don't use that because different people, yes, act, react differently to different things that happen to them. I'm not saying everything that's happened in your life has been fair, but I'm saying that you get to choose how you respond. As unfair and as unpleasant as it might have been, you get to choose how you respond. Because how you respond to it is a reflection of your mental strength and of your personality and your character more than anything else. It's not what happened to me, but how I choose to respond. That's a true reflection of me. Life is unfair to all, but not all respond the same way. And there must be certain virtues dominant in the heart that cause one to reflect a certain way over another. Two women can be found with the same dilemma and in the same challenge, and yet they respond differently according to what's operating within them. Jesus made it known that the blessings and the miracles would come as a proportion of faith. He would say, be it unto you even according to your faith. A man comes to Jesus and say, heal my son. If you can do anything, Help me. Jesus said, it's not whether or not I can do anything. It's whether or not you can believe me for anything. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible. That means it's according to my election. It's according to my own decision. It's according to my own value system, my belief system, my response mechanism that will determine the outcome, not only in the situation, but also in my life because my life is nothing but a series of situations. So no matter what I am and where I am and who I am, life is gonna deal with me a certain kind of way naturally. But 
I put certain knowledge and principles and precepts in my heart so that when life come at me and brings to me what it brings to me, I have a predisposed way that I've chosen to handle that matter. When my enemy do something to me that I don't like, I don't accost my enemy. I don't curse my enemy. I don't fight my enemy. I pray for my enemy because the Lord said, this is the best way to deal with my enemies. And when I feed my enemy, when he's hungry and feed her or give her something to drink when she's thirsty, I am keeping coals of fire upon their head. It is my decision to choose how I will react or respond in a certain matter. And my decision is a reflection of my value system and my belief system. I'm not going to let my enemy out virtue me. This is what I'm telling the women of God tonight. You are a queen. And one thing a queen must always do is display preeminent glory. No matter what the challenge is, don't you lose your composure. When you're under stress, don't you lose your composure. When you're being challenged, don't you lose your composure. When you're, when you're being picked on, when you're being treated unfairly, don't you lose your composure. Maintain your control. You are a queen at all times. But it, but, but you, but it's needed most, these virtues are needed most when you're under pressure. Show me who you are and how you react to pressure and I'll show you who you really are. You don't know your true value system until you're put under pressure. You don't know what you believe until you put under pressure or until you put under isolation. And there are certain different kinds of unique experiences that are only designed to reveal who you really are. Isolation is one of those conditions and situations that's only temporary, but it's designed to reveal who you really are. When you're challenged or chastised, that's another way. Chastisement is designed to reveal who you really are. When you are confronted by, by, or have opposition, the opposition is only designed to show me who you really are. All of those moments are only designed to show me who you are. If I take something that belongs to you, I want to see how you respond. Let's, let's finish this point. Is anybody still with me out there tonight? Watch this. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example. And I pray, women of God, that you, that, that, that you, that you are loved by a man that is not given to embarrassment. You, you don't marry a quarrelsome man. Don't marry a argumentative man. Marry a man that'll let you have the last word, even if your word ain't right. You need to marry a man that you need to marry a man that's strong enough to let you have your moment and he'd not fall apart. But 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 let me say this, women of God, hear me but you also need to be the kind of woman that needs, that knows to acknowledge when you're wrong. God bless you if you marry a man that apologizes and recognizes when he's wrong, but you need to be the kind of woman that knows how to recognize when you're wrong and don't have to wait five days before you apologize. Stop expecting him to apologize when he's wrong, but you never bring yourself to recognize or apologize when you're wrong. And it doesn't matter if he never does it. 
He may never apologize when he's wrong. It doesn't matter. God is not going to deal with you based on what he does. God's going to deal with you based on what you do, who you say you are. And if you're the one professing to be closer to God, then the burden is on you to demonstrate that that closeness is authentic and powerful and transformative. So if I say that I am the true daughter of him, I, 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 I'm following him, I'm serving him, then expect certain conditions and situations to really cut against the will of my flesh. And in the moment when I'm tempted to cry out or to retaliate or to, or to respond in a certain negative way, I will maintain my composure and I will be silent under suffering. I will maintain my dignity and my repose. I will not in any way fracture or let go of my true disposition just because I'm in a challenging situation. Be woman enough to apologize when you're wrong. When you're wrong, say so early. Why does it take you five days to recognize that you're wrong? Why does it take you two days to recognize when you're wrong? You know when you said it, you're wrong. You know when the thought came, you're wrong. It doesn't matter how mad he made you. Admit you, admit you were wrong. It doesn't matter how justified you felt. That does not matter. Well, he did. Stop reciting what he did. Deal with you. Own up to you in it. Watch this. So this, this, the kind of man, listen, let's reverse it. So we see the kind of woman that Mary must have been because of the value and the virtue that was operating in Joseph. But let's reverse it. As much as Joseph chose Mary, Mary also chose Joseph. So it's a reflection of you, the kind of man you choose. I see, I'm looking at the kind of man you chose. Like he, he okay, he's all this negative stuff where you chose him. Okay. You, you calling your friends and you're talking about all the 45 different things he does wrong. Okay, but you chose him. You, you, he gets sick of, you get sick and tired of him. He gets on your nerve because he always does this and all that. Okay, sure. But you chose him though. Amen. I mean, I hear you. Okay, I know what you're doing. You're just doing the vent thing. You just, you don't really want to correct. You just, you just, uh-huh. Okay, you you just want to ear because it's customary among women to call another woman so she can she can cry on somebody's shoulder and she can vent and she can be the victim and 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 and, and, and oh how mean he's been to me and he didn't and and that whole song that a lot of women do and and na 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 and all that and all okay. Uh, enough of that silliness. You chose him. He didn't take it. You gave it to him. So it's on you too. Let me tell you something. And if you said this to a woman, she probably wouldn't talk to you for a year if she ever talked to you again. I will go to battle with women and tell women when they are being wronged by a man but I'm also the same man that'll tell a thousand women in an auditorium, listen to these unpleasant words that nobody on TV will ever tell you, that a lot of what's going on in a relationship, it ain't on him, it's on you. You tripping, you crazy, you lazy, you ain't doing this, you ain't saying that, you ain't following through with your promise. You provoked that. That situation happened and went down because of what you did. That's on you. Stop this. Stop looking for somebody to cry on when you did that. That's on you, sister. And God bless the woman that's mature enough and woman enough and strong enough to acknowledge that it's on me. God bless the woman. God bless the woman that'll do that. That'll say, you know what? 
me stop blaming him for everything. This is on me too. This, this is the day that I accept full responsibility for getting in the car. I should have knew where that car was going, but I didn't. I should have asked questions, but I didn't. I was assuming the difference between a woman and a girl is a girl assumes a woman knows. A woman investigates. A woman asks questions. A woman pursues the matter. And if something don't sit right with her, then she keep asking questions until she get the answer that she knows she needs. She doesn't play around because she knows there are too many consequences on this thing. When a relationship falls apart, it's going to affect her differently than it's going to affect him. A man can physically just pack up and move on and just move on. But the woman is left with luggage and issues and things and bodies that she has to tend to contend to and care for. And it affects her and, and I, one of the things I noticed among my sisters is that I see my sisters that are worn down because life has been unkind and unfair. And a lot of it has to do because they assumed that they knew what they were getting into when they were getting into it with them. But they were operating out of a competitive thing that I noticed a lot of women have. A lot of women tend to get with men just because they don't want to be the woman that's alone. And you already know that this cat ain't the kind of man to even be dealing with. But because you're so fancifully wanting to prove to other women that you're not the one that nobody wants, you end up co-signing on and getting with somebody that you don't really have any alignment with just to make sure that you're not the only woman that's by yourself. It is better to be alone and be right and have peace than be with a clown and constantly in turmoil and warfare and fighting and arguing. And I pray that God will raise up a generation of women who will look their sisters in the eye and hold them accountable. Sister, stop browbeating him and blaming him for your ineptitude and your irresponsibility and your impatience and the part that you played in the matter. Stop putting it on him. If he didn't take it, then you gave it to him. And if you gave it to a clown, expect the baby to come out with a red nose and a funny wig. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody, in Jesus' name. You're not shocked by what he's doing for real. You know what that was. You know what it was because you know where you were when you got with it. Bo, but now that your eyes are open, and now you see the difference between the little girl and the grown woman. Now you realize it's, it's on me. So Mary chose Joseph as much as Joseph chose Mary. And it says something about the character of Mary in the fact that she chose a just man. Mary chose a just man. Look at what was operating. We just uncovered one of the major clues. Look at what was operating in Mary that made her desirable by God. Mary knew what kind of man to choose. Anybody out there in this land? Anybody out there listening to me tonight? Mary knew what kind of man to choose. I don't know if it's because her mother taught her. I don't know if it's because her grandmother taught her. I don't know what happened in Mary's life, but Mary had choices too. Mary could have chose other men, but she chose Joseph because she saw a virtue in Joseph. She noticed Joseph was right in his heart. She watched how Joseph spoke to and treated his mother. She watched Joseph go to work Joseph would get up and go to work and she would see him walking through the village. And little Joe always had his backpack and his lunch and Joe, Joe focus. And when the little girls would be playing around, Joseph didn't look. Joseph's eyes was on his job. He was going to work. I, you know what, what? A woman told me one time, what makes a man really attractive is when he's focused. 
when he ain't distracted, when he ain't silly, when he got laser focus on his craft, when he about his business. Marry a man that's about his business. Because when you marry a man that's about his business and his business is you, he will be about you. So Mary knew what to pick. She knew the virtue to look for in a man. Joseph was a young man. He was young, but he was a man. Teach your daughters what to look for. Every mother listening to me right now, every single mother listening to my voice right now, commit to this. Teach your sons and your daughters what virtues to look for. Stop assuming that they know. Stop letting your sons marry hoochies. Stop marrying, stop letting your, talk to him. Tell him, let me tell you something. I know why you probably like her or fair to ask him. You got a son, you got a son, ask him. What, what, tell me what you see in her. What do you like about her? I'm not going to pick for you. I'm not trying to tell you what. I just want to know what you're thinking. Is. What is it about her that you like? And then listen to him. And then make him explain that. And then show him where there is no virtue in the things that he names or show him the problem that will develop from whatever attribute he's focusing on. Because I tell young men this all the time, them two twin towers she got, them two things up there, let me tell you some sour milk comes out of them too. And you need to be careful. You need to be careful. Glory to God. I tell men in all time, Grow up, don't be, they listen, I know what that looks like, but there's some stuff come with that. Them hips contain more than you can know now. There's some stuff come with them hips. And if all she's displaying, and if all she's advertising is that, it's because ain't nothing up here. Don't focus on that down there, focus on this up here. This is how I talk to my son. What am I saying? I'm saying, to the young, untrained mind, you have to help them uncover, discern, or investigate the greater. The lesser is oftentimes apparent. It doesn't require a lot of discovery. You can look at it and see what it is, but there's something going on behind that. And you have to help the children know. You have the children know how to recognize the virtue that they need to recognize. That's what I'm saying. So watch this. Time's sake. Now, Joseph is finna to vacate, and I'm going to get to this part about Mary in a moment. Joseph was about to vacate, but the Spirit of God intervenes. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She is the woman you thought her to be. Don't be afraid. Joseph, I know you see evidence that contradicts who you believe she was. And to, I want to talk to some. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know who this applies to. But listen to me, my sister. You may now have evidence or issues ongoing that contradict who you really are. You may be thinking to yourself, I could only do this if I didn't have to deal with this. And I'm telling you that that this is not a barrier to God. And it is quite common in all of our lives to have something ongoing that feels like it's a contradiction to your character and, and have the effect that it seems like it's denying you of something you really wanna do or who you really wanna be. Mary had the evidence of a pregnancy that contradicted the pristine character and virtues that she displayed to Joseph. When she shows up pregnant to, to Joseph, it looks like Mary is a hypocrite. And so he being the kind of man he was, however, and the fact that he loved her, because if he was going to put her away privately, even though what she had done contradicted him, if he was still going to put her away privately, Joseph was a very noble man. This man had a good heart. Say what you will about Joseph. Joseph had a good heart because he was even handled this very unpleasant situation. 
a certain way. God bless you. One of the ways you'll know, one of the ways you know what kind of man is watch how he handles unpleasant situations. Why is that critical? Because if you're called to be in his life, you got to know how to medicate his mind with your voice and words. Know how to talk to that man when he's frustrated. You got to know how to coach him when he don't see the answer. You got to know how to push him when he don't feel like going any further. There are going to be moments in his life where he is exposed, where he is showing evidence of weakness and yet he's not weak. You can, you, can, you can see weakness in a moment that's not a true reflection of the strength. This is what I'm saying about Mary. Mary has evidence that would cause people to contradict or think that she contradict who she really is. She's pregnant and Joseph don't know who the father is. But Mary is a virtuous woman. She's been chosen by God. And sometimes, women, you can be chosen by God for something unpleasant or cause other people to look down on you. And they're looking down on you because of something that God has chosen to do with you. Now, we're, we're so, we're born again, we're saved, and we're familiar with the text. But let me try to put this in context of the mind that the people at the time probably was looking at the situation. We're so familiar with the Bible narrative that we have forgotten that if we were alive in that day and time, we would have been looking at Mary like everybody else looking at Mary. Imagine being a young woman that has something happen to you that has never happened to anybody else in human history. This young girl is a teenager and she shows up pregnant while she was engaged to a man soon to be married. And... Everybody naturally assumed that her and Joseph had physically been together when they had not. And so there were rumors being spread. You know how people talk. You know how you used to talk about other people. Mary had to deal with the look of disdain and the judgmental gaze of people who were self-righteous in their thinking towards her because now Mary has showed up pregnant at a time in her life when she's about to get married. And so people are thinking in the carnal who don't know that God is working a thing that Mary is a cheater. This is why we got to be careful never to put our mouth on people. Am I talking to anybody out there tonight? Anybody in the car with me? Is anybody listening and registering with what I'm saying tonight? Don't put your mouth on anyone else you don't know what stage of the process they're in you are nobody's judge don't you put your mouth on your sister if you don't have anything encouraging to say don't say anything at all because she might be a mary chosen by god to do something that nobody else was qualified to do blessed are you mary among women watch this the angel has god sometimes when we're about to get off script god intervenes sometimes when we're so discouraged and we're blinded by the circumstances and we're about to get off path god intervenes joseph is about to mess up god's plans so and god and he's about to do it for a right reason in joseph's heart Joseph feels like Mary has been in violation, but he's not going to judge her. He's not going to condemn her. I'm going to do this privately. I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to make her a public example, meaning if you know anything about the history, she would have had to have been stoned to death. The penalty was not only ostracization, but ultimately because she's now gotten pregnant, the penalty from that time was being stoned to death publicly. And he did not want her to be publicly stoned. So Joseph was just backing up out of the situation, hoping that it would work out for Mary. You know, I'm not going to play a role in, in telling everybody what I think you've done and causing you to be a public shame. I'm just going to back out and get out and let you and God work that out. God bless Joseph for being that kind of man. 
maybe you and them broke up, but don't you condemn them. Don't talk negatively about your ex. Don't, don't, don't. Every, sometimes people will come around you saying things about them to see what your response is going to be, hoping you say something negative. Instead, I want you to say something positive. Say something positive about you. Find some positive. Because listen, they could say something negative about you if they really wanted to and would be right. So I want you to say every time their name comes up, I want you to say something positive about them. And it ain't going to be easy, but do it. And if you are sold that, you can reap that. You reap what you sow. So when you get that temptation, because something just went down and you want to say something so bad, you want to just, oh, Jesus, you just want to, you, you, and you want somebody to know the real deal. Don't do that. You're going to do what Joseph did. Joseph did not want her to be put to a public shame. He didn't want her to be uh, stoned to death. So he privately was preparing to put her away. And God knew that his motive was right, but his method was wrong. And God intervened. Watch this. God said to the angel, don't put your wife away. Notice that he's still calling her his wife. Marry thy wife. Marry your wife. The man is trying to get out the situation. But, but, but the Lord is saying, that's still your wife, man. I know what it looks like. Is there anybody out there ever been in a situation where it looks like one thing, but the reality is something else. And you're not in the position you can talk about it. You got you to gotta sit and let everybody draw their own conclusions. You got to let them feel like they right. You got to let them talk. Because you know what it looks like. I have been in several situations where it looked like, a, and I know what it looks like, but it is not what it looks like. And it's hard to be in a situation where you feel like you need to defend yourself and God tells you to hold your peace. Be quiet. I'll defend you. You don't have to justify yourself to them. And then be quiet. And I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm talking to somebody right now in a situation where, where this is the Lord's word to you. I'll defend you. I'll defend you. You hold your peace. Let them say what they say. Let them do what they're doing. But you hold your peace. I'll do the defending. I'll protect you. Let me hurry up. He says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the thing that's conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That's the, what's going on in her is, is God. It's God's doing something. God's working this out. So don't trip. I want to tell my sister, listen to me tonight, right now, with the way your life looking right now, don't trip. All of the recent events, God says, don't trip. You can't see ahead what he sees ahead, but to a beautiful place. If you refuse to trip right here, don't trip. Don't trip. I know how it looks and I know how they're looking at you, but don't trip. I got this. This is what he's telling Mary. And this is what he's telling Joseph. Don't trip. I know you hear what the people saying, but don't trip. Don't trip. Let me finish this. Can you write this in your notes and can you type this? Let God finish this. Let God finish it. You ain't at the end of it yet. Let him finish this. Let him finish this. Watch this. For time's sake, God, I'm, for time's sake, go with me. Go with me to Luke. Luke's gospel. We're answering the question in a very elongated manner. We're answering the question, what made her special? And clues are emerging as we go through tonight. 
And I'm really not talking about Mary, I'm talking about you. Luke's gospel, for time's sake, watch this. Luke 1, 26. Luke 1, 26. Amen. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The angel Gabriel was sent to a virgin, to a certain virgin. I'm talking to a woman of God tonight listening. You can be a virgin again. I don't have time to labor, but I want you to reach out to me and make me explain what I'm saying. I want you to reach out to me privately, email me and say, okay, I remember you saying this and I don't want to put everybody in my business, but break this thing down to me about being a virgin again. Bishop, you don't know what I've been, what I've done, how many times. So, I mean, you're going to have to help me with this one. I'm telling you, you're not hearing me wrong. You're hearing me right. You can be a virgin again. Now, to qualify this one question, I ask everybody listening to this question. Can God, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything he can't do? Is there anything impossible for God? If he can bring a dead man out of the grave whose body has started to decompose, he can do anything with you. Write this in your notes for you. And I want you to write it just like this. God can do anything with me. Amen. Amen. God, if he can bring a baby out of a dead womb, Sarah's body was dead, the scripture says. But he brought a baby out of it. Her breast had dried, but he brought a baby out. God can do anything with you. I want you to accept that as the truth of your life. Now, going forward for the rest of your life, I want you to be reminded of that whenever something pops off or something goes down or something goes off rail this scene, remember, God can do anything with me. I have not disqualified myself. I have not removed myself from the possibilities of God. Lord, I know that even now, you can use me. I messed up so many times, but Lord, I know you can even use my mess ups. It's not over. And listen, I want to give some woman this word right here. You're going to mess up again. You're going to make mistakes again. And it's not over now, and it's not going to be over there. Glory to God. Glory to God. He already knows your mess ups that are coming. He knows them now. He's not shocked or surprised. He, he's the author and finisher. He's written the whole, he knows in advance. So don't you get down on yourself because you feel like you wish you would have and you wish you should have and all of that. Yes, that would have been fine, but God is still able. We've all had that, I wished I had a moment, or I wished I didn't have a moment. All of us have had that. I'm here tonight to tell you that even that's working in his plan. It's not over for you. Watch this. To a virgin espoused, you're not too old and you're not too young. Type amen if you accept that and receive that. If you accept that and receive that, type amen. You're not too old and you're not too young.
you know how we get in our inner selves and we feel like and we're 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 having a moment you know how we just feel like you know i wish i had got this i wish i wish 20 years ago i should have and i wish that i man if, if i had only and you and you and you had that kind of moment okay i'm here tonight to calm you down and bless you and tell you it's okay I'm not concerned about what you've done. I'm only concerned about have you learned anything? You're, it's not over. All God wanted to just teach you. He, he knew. He knew. He already knew. Demand more of yourself, but don't be too hard on yourself. That's what I'm trying to say. No losses, just lessons. Glory to God. That's so well said. I hope that every woman writes that down in her notes. No losses, just lessons. Now you have something to teach. And I pray that you will do this, Sister Charlotte. I pray that you'll go find a 10-year-old you or a 15-year-old you or a 20-year-old you if she'll listen. I pray you go find a young version of you and teach her and tell her, young lady, you're a queen. And God has brought me in your life to help you be that. That's why you're a mother. That's why you're an aunt. That's why you, that's why you are who you are. That's why to teach another woman how to be what she is. Watch this. God of mine, watch this. The angel Gabriel sent to Nazareth to a virgin, to a virgin espoused, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, which is the king's lineage. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Three things right here in the more for time's sake, where I could go on 30 more minutes easy. Watch this. But for time's sake, watch this. Three components that made or caused Mary to stand out. Can you write these down? Watch this. Number one, she was favored. She was favored. Number two, the Lord was with her. And as a result of one and two, one and two produce three. One and two produce numerically one plus two is three. Well, also here, take the one point with the second point, they produce the third point, which is you're blessed among women because the Lord is with you and you have been favored. Because the Lord is with you and you have been favored, you're blessed among women. You're blessed among women because you have been favored and the Lord is with you. Every woman listening to me right now, I'm talking to you personally. You are blessed among women because the Lord is with you. And you are highly favored. And you got to see this in yourself. Treat yourself in this. Wear this jacket. When she said, when she saw him, she was, the Bible used the word troubled, but she was perplexed. And she thought to herself, what kind of greeting is this? What kind of situation is this? What kind of thought is this I'm entertaining? And the angel said, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you're going to conceive. I was ministering to a woman earlier today 
about a son that she's going to have. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He had a name before he even had a body. Pay close attention, Sister Tyler. Pay close attention to that name you've been hearing. And just keep it in your heart. Don't tell anybody else about the name. Don't even share with nobody. Don't even tell nobody about the name. But listen to, listen. He'll give you the name well before you have the body. He'll give you the name before you even have the husband. That's what's going on in this passage right here. She gets the name of her son before she's married officially. And he shall be great. And he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. She's about to give birth to a king. Does anybody see that? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. This thing is big that God is up to with you. You are a queen. And a queen, when she gives birth, she gives birth to a king. Because there's royal blood in her, there's going to be royal blood in him. Oh, God bless you. I wish I had more time to dig deeper into this thing. But for time's sake tonight, I pray. I have poured out bountifully in the hope that it causes you a realignment in your thinking and in your view of yourself and how you treat yourself and how you process and how you move forward and how you how you, how, how, how you how you work and do what you do. You're on your way somewhere, woman of God. No looking back. No losses, only lessons. It's time for you to keep moving forward. There's going to be some costs to the work of improvement, though. We're, we committed to a principle eight months ago, C-A-N-I, constant and never-ending improvement. Constant and never-ending improvement. Real quick, real quick. A queen does not blame others. A queen does not argue. A queen does not complain. A queen does not make excuses. A queen does not waste. Amen. A queen does not blame. A queen does not argue and is not argumentative. Make your point and let it go. You don't need to state your point four, five, six, seven, eight times. State your point and then let the matter go. Stop bringing up stuff from three days ago. Stop that. End that. A queen does not complain. A queen does not make excuses. A queen does not waste. A queen doesn't waste money, doesn't waste food, doesn't waste time, doesn't waste her words. A queen does not waste. Amen. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these queens. Thank you for the other women that are going to be made queens because of their ministry to them. Let this word go forth all over the world. Be glorified 
tonight in the way you're teaching us and the fruit that is born in our lives. I pray for every woman, every mother, every daughter, every sister, every aunt, every queen under the sound of my voice. Arise and shine. Your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Be blessed in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. All right, women of God, we got some work to do. Bless you even more. You, there's constant and never an improvement. All right, when we hang up tonight, you're about to get into the grind of the improvement. All right, get the closet together. Get the refrigerator together. Get the car together. Get the Get this, the car is washed tomorrow and it's vacuumed out tomorrow. The closet are lined, the blouses, the skirts, the shoes, everything in its proper place. Stuff packed up. You need to give clothes away, then give that away. Go to the refrigerator, throw out the stuff that don't need to be in there. Go to the junk drawer, get up. You got work to do. You're constantly chiseling, working, planning, working, doing your thing. You're constantly improving. You're a queen. I love you. Be strong, be blessed. And every man you touch, make him strong and better because he's with a queen. Bless you. And don't forget what I always say. Jesus is a more excellent way. Amen.